Ephesians chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. It's good to be here so far. Appreciated the devotional and also our Sunday school time and also the singing this morning. Um, as you can see, the title of my message this morning is The Prohibitions of the New Man. And many of you are probably asking what the word prohibition means. Um, I guess the dictionary says it this way, the action of forbidding or outlawing something, especially by law. And you may be wondering, why would you preach a subject on forbidding something or outlawing something? And that's um, probably not the best message to give. Sometimes, not a message that's too popular. Um, I was told that by my family. Um, and I guess I have two justifications for the sermon this morning. First one is we didn't hear one of these messages for a long time. Is that right, Raymond? Uh, <laughs> or some of you who are a little older. The second one is I'm preaching out of Ephesians, and it's right here in the Scripture. So hopefully it's not my opinions and my ideas, but directly from scripture. There's five prohibitions or five um, forbidden things in our message today. I'm going to open up with a question, maybe, or a statement. According to Peter Liebold of the National Museum of American History on January 17, 1920, there was a significant day in American history. Does anybody know why? Now, Lavelle is not here to help us here, but can somebody tell us what happened on that day? That word prohibition I thought might give us some hints. Anybody? Yeah, the prohibition era took place. Yes, and what was that, Ara? Well, it was the outlaw of alcohol. That is correct. Prohibition lasted from 1920 until 1933. Um, it was what they called the Grand National Experiment, or the Prohibition, which was first in force um, in 1920. The 18th Amendment, which illegalized the manufacture, which illegalized the manufacture and transportation and sale of alcohol, was passed by the U.S. Congress in 1917. And in 1919, the amendment was ratified by three quarters of the nation's na states that were required to make it constitutional. So, believe it or not, alcohol was illegal in our country, um, or at least the producing of alcohol, for 14 years. Um, and it was an amendment to our Constitution. It was completely fro prohibited, or the word prohibition comes in there. Many people throughout history would say this law was a mistake, uh, made things worse in our country. 
But the fact of the matter is, it probably did not. If you look back at history and examine what took place during those 14 years that alcohol was outlawed, outlawed you might call it a great success in those 14 years, unlike what history will tell you. There were a few things I believe most people don't know about the law. And after doing a little research, I just want to mention a few of these things. The root of prohibition were planted during the Second Great Awakening, the roots for this prohibition era. It was Christian men and especially Christian women who began the great movement called the Temperance Movement or the Prohibition Movement. This movement was organized in churches and in 10 years and in 10 years, it had more than 1.5 million followers or members. Now, think of our, the country was not very large at that time. There wasn't 100 million people in the country. I'm not sure what the population was. But 1.5 million members. Many in history argue that it did nothing to slow down alcohol consumption. The truth is alcohol consumption decreased by 30% the first year of the law. And before, the, and before that, it was increasing exponentially every year. Um, now, the, actually, the worst thing about what was happening at that time, which is still alcohol today, there was a lot of domestic violence. Women were being abused um, because of alcohol and a lot of other disruptions of alcohol. So you say, why talk about that? What's that have to do with Ephesians 4? Um, I'm just talking, I just wanted to mention the word prohibition, outlaw. And sometimes when we think of this thing of outlawing something, it is not always a negative so it doesn't always have to be a negative thought. And I'm going to talk about that maybe just a little bit more here before we get into Scripture. Does, do, does God give any laws? I think we know that question or that answer already. God's first word to man in the Garden of Eden was a command or a prohibition against eating of the tree of good and evil. The first written words from God to man were the Ten Commandments, which were, again were commandments that we need to obey. And yes, also the New Testament has many do-nots or prohibitions, which we'll find today in our lesson. Um, God gives us laws or rules that we sh of things that we shouldn't do. I also want to emphasize the following rules or laws. Ne I also want to emphasize that rules and laws never save us from God's ju judgment. Even our best attempt to follow God's rules will always fail. I'm so thankful that Christ's atonement saves me, not my trying to follow God's rules or laws. But is that a reason to view the Ten Commandments or anything God prohibits as negative or unhelpful? The answer is absolutely no. Romans 6.15, I'll just read that. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? No, God forbid it says. Um, even though we are under grace and not under the law, we still need prohibitions in our lives, in our country, in our home, in our community, even in our sports teams, in our schools, and yes, even in our churches. God can use rules to create good structure that can be very helpful in our lives. I've seen the most successful, disciplined Christian people with structure, using structure and rules, to improve their work and their lives. I don't believe it's very different for us as disciplined Christians to use and appreciate the structure God gives us in his word. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body, I'm sorry, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I should be a castaway. That was in the NIV. In Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those trained by it. Again, in the NIV. It is so evident in the Bible. It is evident in the Bible God does not object to prohibitions. But prohibitions, again, will not change the heart. Um, sorry, I should... What does God say about it? Prohibitions will not change the heart. Um, only Christ can change our hearts. Our hearts and attitudes need always to be the first focus. Rules or prohibitions should help us realize that we can't be good alone. We can never be good enough to keep all the laws. I hope we all understand that. 
Our righteousness has come from someone other than ourselves. Prohibitions don't remove the need for a savior, but prove our need for a savior. Our focus should always be first on a heart change because that is the only thing that will help us follow the laws of God. A pure heart will give us pure actions. We will see that in the verses today in, in Ephesians. Every prohibition should have a positive response to the prohibition. And we find that again in Ephesians. All five prohibitions we're going to talk about today all had a positive response in those prohibitions. Um, in Christ, there's always a positive or correct response to an adverse action. Look at what God told Adam in the garden. You may freely eat of the tree of the garden. Then he goes on. He says, you may freely eat of all the trees of the garden, but not of the tree of good and evil. So in every law or every prohibition God gives, he usually gave it in a positive, gave a positive response to that. In today's scripture, we're going to find correct responses to everything we shouldn't do. And I feel we should always give rules or prohibitions with positive responses. We should always look at rules as freedoms. Because of this rule, we can do so much more. Prohibitions shouldn't be spoken of and given. Prohibitions should be spoken of and given as a positive thing, or given a positive responses with that. Rules are often unappreciated because they're often given in a negative way, and are frequently and they're frequently people are inconsistent with the way they give rules. But does that diminish the fact that we all need prohibitions in our lives? Now, is that the only reason people hate rules? Just because people have been inconsistent in giving them? No, I want to be honest with you here. Probably a big reason we hate rules, or even the big reason we might not like the sermon this morning, is because often we have a rebellious attitude towards somebody telling me what to do. And I'm not exempt from that. Probably nobody exempt from that. Um, but that often is one of the biggest reasons we don't like somebody telling us what and what we shouldn't do. And today's world is no different than it was 100 years ago that way. We still resist prohibitions. The prohibition era was fought and resisted um, by people in the United States, and eventually it was amended and thrown out. I believe we need to see prohibitions as something God has given us for our benefit, despite the many abuses when men use rules for their own power and not to honor God. Let's go into our lesson now. Let's go into Ephesians. Open your Bibles up with me if you like. Um, to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start verse 17. Um, and we're going to see the Gentile walk. And I don't think I'm going to take the time to read these verses, but you can follow along and look at these verses as we get into um, what the Gentile, what is the Gentile walk? The Gentile walk is not the Christian walk. I think we obviously know that. That was the walk of the Gentile, of the way we used to live. By the way, we're all Gentiles here, I think. Um, but that's the Gentile walk is the way we all used to walk before we were Christians. Um, the Gentile walk means a way of life, how people live their lives. Today, we sometimes call the Gentile walk the worldly walk or the walk of the world. Um, we must understand that there are only two ways to live life. We're either living it like the Gentile walk, or we're living it like the new man, um, or the Christian walk. <clears throat> There's not an in-between walk. In Matthew 7, Jesus said, There is a broad and narrow road. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to, to this destruction. That is the Gentile walk. There's no getting around it. Jesus clearly stated, There's only two ways for us to walk. One way, following the ways of the world, the other is following Christ's way. Is that simple enough? I think it should be pretty obvious to us. Often we don't like to think of it that way. We'd like to find that middle walk, right, where we can take both. <laughs> it's not there. You'll never read that in Scripture. Um, there is only the walk of the Christian and the walk of the world. And we have to understand that and believe that. In verse 17, Paul says, "...the walk is walked in vanity of their minds." Someone who walks in vanity is walking without purpose, aimless, just following the crowd, not knowing where he is going. 
They are not thinking about their future. We look at Romans 1, 21 to 32. We know those verses. They became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. That is what it looks like for someone to walk the Gentile walk. Aimless, without thought, um, without much purpose, just following the crowd and the world around them. <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves, what Satan is doing to get us to walk that same walk? We should be asking ourselves that question, because Satan is ask, trying to find that walk for each one of us, the Gentile walk, the world's mindset. These three verses clearly, if you look at these three verses, I'm not going to read them again, but they clearly explain what it means to walk like the world and to show us the progression of that walk. And when I mean progression, it's a downhill progression. Um, we know that. You look at the world around us. They're not, I don't see our country and our world progressing upward in any way. In a lot of ways, it's a progression downward um, when we walk the Gentile walk. He goes on to explain the worldly mind a bit more in verse 18. They have their understanding darkened. Now, these words sometimes are a little hard for us to understand. You just dig into it a little deeper and you will see what does he mean by their understanding darkened. They are not thinking where their ways are leading them. Does that sound familiar? They go from ignorance, having their understanding darkened, to blindness or hardness of their heart. Then in verse 19, I think I'm going to read verse 19. Who being time past, feelings having given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now we say, what does, does it mean to be in times past? Or how does it say those words? Who being past feelings, I'm sorry. Who being past feelings have having their understanding darkened. Um, notice the progression. Sin always leads to a continual downward spiral. It goes from who being past feelings... Or if you look that word up, it just means, or look those words up, it means being callous to what's right. So God gives them over to, be, to it says, being past feelings. They don't have feelings. They become callous. They don't see what's right and wrong. Um, the literal meaning of the phrase means past feelings carry on, carries on the metaphor of callousness or losing the capacity to feel pain. More pain, which is <clears throat> moral pain, which is healthy moral pain, keeps us from going deeper into sin, our conscience. They start losing their conscience. So we go from ignorance to callousness and losing the capacity to understand where sin is going to take them. That natural progression of sin continues. They're given over to lasciviousness, to work on cleanness with greediness. Now, again, those are words that we don't use very often, so let's dig into what those words actually mean. The word, uses, the word used here signifies... A lust devoid of all sense of decency. Now, we can picture that in our country, right? <laughs> in many ways, we live in a country where decency has been thrown out. That's lasciviousness. That's what we, have, we find in the world, not only in our country, but anywhere where we're, not walking, um, the, uh, where we're not walking the walk God wants us to walk. The word used here signifies a lust devoid of all sense of decency. Recklessly, grossly animalistic. Does that sound familiar? Are we hitting what we are seeing in our society today? I think pretty close Paul hit it 2,000 years ago um, to where we're at today. To where we're at when we walk the Gentile walk. Where all of us will be at if we walk the Gentile walk eventually. I believe it's essential for us not just to look at the world as the sins out there, but to understand Satan is trying to pull us into the same worldly mindset, so we can have, so he can have us walk the Gentile walk or walk the way of the world. Does that make sense? I think we should think about that. Um, often, when we think of lasciviousness or we think of the evils of the world, we think of something out there. But remember, Satan would want each one of us, or should I say, when we walk the ways of the world, we are following the same lasciviousness the same reckless, abandoned to what's right that the world is following. I believe it's essential for us not just to look at the world, but realize that that worldly walk, Satan tries to have us do also. But, thank goodness, there's a much better way which we can find in the following verses. 
um, which I think, which I think, is what we want to talk about this morning: the Christian walk. Now, let's look at the Christian walk in verses 20 to 24. It's beautiful. It's what we need to hang on to. It's what we need to understand when we look at the world around us. We need to understand there is a better way. Um, and I hope everyone came to church this morning with the desire to find that. Um, it's what we're here for, to talk about that, to spend time in God's word, um, seeing what the Christian walk is about. Paul says here, we have not learned about Christ this way, the world's way or the Gentile way. Paul says, we have not learned about Jesus this way. <clears throat> and he's talking about the Gentile walk. Our Christian doctrine or what we believe about God is to learn Christ. Or what he, he says there, we have not learned Christ this way. So we see in here that it's pretty important for us to understand who Christ is if we're going to walk a different way. And that means we need to have right theology, a right understanding of God, a desire to know what the Word of God says, a desire to know who God is. That's what it means by not having learned Christ, the opposite of that is to learn Christ. And that's what we should do uh, when it comes to finding the, the Christian walk. Our Christian doctrine or what we believe about God is to learn Christ. If we struggle with walking in the way of the Gentiles, it might mean we're not understanding what Christ wants for us. We're not in the Word. We are not understand um, the, what God is asking of us in Scripture. I recently come across the quote by Albert Moeller that is so true. Ideas always have consequences. Um, and if we don't know what we believe, Satan will quickly have us in the Gentile walk. Verses 20 and 21 tell us that what we read and what we've been taught matters because these affect our understanding of truth and our knowledge of truth affects how we live. Our understanding of truth and our understanding of Jesus, which is truth, this understanding, as it says in verse 21, leads us to put off the old man. It helps us to quit following the ways of the world or the ways of the Gentile. It enables us to follow Christ, the narrow and straight, um, the narrow way and the straight gate. But we have put on verse 23 and 24. Here's the exciting part um, about the Christian walk. The first thing we need to understand about walking the way God wants us to walk, or walking the way of the new man, not like the Gentiles, is that we can only do this through Jesus Christ. Okay? Let's be very clear. When we talk about prohibition, we need to understand we cannot follow Christ on our own, but we do it through G Jesus Christ. And it comes from regeneration, or through salvation by Jesus Christ. We can't say, one day now, I'm going to be so disciplined today that I will not... Follow the world, or I will not walk the walk of the Gentile. I am now going to be righteous and holy. I will discipline myself only to do right and holy things. Brothers and sisters, that's not possible. We need Jesus Christ. We need his atonement. We need his saving. And we need the Holy Spirit for us to follow Christ the way he wants us to walk. You can't do that without Christ's regeneration in your life and his changing you through his righteousness. I love the verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we, might be, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He becomes righteous. He, we become righteous the moment we are saved. This happens not through any of our works, but through faith in him. Regeneration comes in three steps. And we see the three steps here. Putting off the old man being renewed in your mind, and putting on the new man. There's one essential thing that we often overlook, and that's the second step in verse 23. When we become Christians, we are renewed in the spirit of our minds. The Holy Spirit enters our lives. This is so important for us to walk the walk of the new man. I'm going to say that again. One of the most important things, or the most important thing for us to be able to walk the walk of the new man is to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, the Holy Spirit will help us still um, help us to walk that walk the way God wants us to walk. The Holy Spirit is our guide in our walk, and we desperately need the Holy Spirit to be able to walk in righteousness and true holiness, as it says in verse 24. 
should be our goal, to walk in righteousness and true holiness. And we're not going to do that without the Holy Spirit in our lives. Also, to be clear, if you don't believe it is essential to walk in righteousness and true holiness, then you don't think it's necessary to walk the path of the new man. The straight gate, the narrow way that leads to life. No, our righteousness doesn't come from us, but yes, our walk does matter if we expect to find eternal life. We need to walk the walk of the new, uh, new man if we are going to find eternal life. I don't know I can make it any clearer than that because there's only one way. The Bible clearly says in Matthew 7. Christ wants us and expects us to walk the new walk, the walk Christ walk. The good news is that in the following few verses, God gives us instructions how to do that. And this morning, I'm going to go into those instructions, those five prohibitions that we're going to find in the next five verses or in the next six or seven verses. Um, these are structures that will help us um, walk that walk. I'd like to remind us as Christians and some of us young Christians that God never expects us to walk that walk perfectly. We will make mistakes. When we do, we need to get up and try again and not give, and not give up when we fall. One of my favorite verses John, and found in John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's an enormous blessing for us who try to walk perfectly. We won't, but God will help us when we confess our sins, and he will always forgive us our sins. I love the illustration Paul Washer gives. He says, as a little boy, he used to go out with his dad on the farm to the cow stable early in the morning. And he said, in Minnesota, there was always deep snow in the wintertime, and his dad would step off the porch and step into the snow and make those big tracks in the snow um, and he would come behind and step into his dad's footsteps and stumble many times because those footsteps were wide and, uh, and were big and the snow was deep. But when he'd stumble, he'd get back up and he'd continue to walk in, God, in, in his father's footsteps. Isn't that a picture of us? We're trying to walk in God's footsteps and we stumble. If we look at, if you look at my life, I think look at many of our lives, as we're walking those footsteps, so often we're stumbling, but we get back up and continue to walk in God's footsteps. Um, that, I hope, is our goal today. Let's go into um, the, five pro the five prohibitions of the new man. Starting in verse, um, I want to point out again how God gives us his prohibitions. With every negative command, he gives a positive response. I also want to go back to verse 23 again and remind us of something I believe is essential when we think about God's commands, commands he has given us. The most important thing when doing something or when telling others to do or not to do something is not that we focus, is that we focus more on the attitude behind someone's actions than the action itself. Paul says in verse 23, look at verse 23 again. just want to step back there before we get into these prohibitions. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The NIV says to be made new in the attitudes of your minds. Um, and <clears throat> that we can be made new in the attitudes of our mind. When we become new in Christ, our attitudes should change. And they matter because God changed our hearts. If he did that, our spirit or attitudes would be made new. Our actions do matter, but our attitudes matter much more. And they tell everyone around us if we are walking like a new man or if we're walking like the Gentiles walk. I have to bring in camp here at this time. Um, I was at the boys' camp, and I think enough of you know a little bit about the boys' camp. One of the rules of camp was you do one of the only two rules of camps, were, and one rule was we do everything with good attitudes. When we become a, we do everything with good attitudes. There are many structures and schedules and expectations helped us in many ways at camp. We were expected to follow these expectations and structures, but our, ma our attitude mattered much more than all the expectations we had to follow. It may also be interesting to note that if we weren't willing to follow the group's expectations or roles or whatever you want to put in, that name, um, in there, it was usually a clear indicator that our attitudes weren't real good either. But this morning we come to five very clear prohi uh, prohibitions or expectations or rules for us as Christians. 
Let's look at these prohibitions and ask ourselves, how are we doing? They may indicate our attitude or whether we are walking like the Gentiles or like a new man. Most of these rules at face value look like rules we may believe are given to immature Christians and not to, maybe not to us Christians here at Weavertown. But I think we will find that these rules are pretty convicting and they're for us here. First rule we're going to get to is don't lie, but speak the truth to, the, to your neighbor. I think, again, at face value, most of us say, look at verse 25 and say, I'm not a liar. I don't usually say lies. I don't say things untruthful to people. I have it maybe in the past one time. So this is for someone else. But let's get right into this. What does it mean to speak the truth? I'm guessing, um, like I said, we probably don't see ourselves as liars. But what does God think of as lying? Satan is the father of lies. Jesus called himself the way, the truth, and the, uh, the way, the truth, and the light. And he expects us to follow him by being truthful people. I think we all know, know that and agree with that. I know that can seem a bit complicated and hard to understand. How do we do that? How do we live an open, transparent life that reflects the truth of Jesus Christ? Not telling an open lie is not usually too hard for most of us. But what about being an honest and transparent person who's not manipulative and willing to tell the truth no matter what it may cost them? That's a bit harder. And if we let God or our Holy Spirit reflect in our hearts, I think we can probably all say that is a bit harder. To be completely honest, to not be manipulative in the way we speak to people, to say the truth no matter what, to be transparent. I'm not going to give examples of lying but I'll let the Holy Spirit work in your life this week as you do your business or as you work in your workplace or as you talk to your children or as you talk to people around you. Let the Holy Spirit work. Ask the Holy Spirit to say, am I completely honest? Am I completely transparent? Am I the kind of person Christ is asking me? Am I walking the walk where he says in verse 25, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I don't think I need to say more. I'll let the Holy Spirit work in your life as you take this prohibition and see how you're doing um, where it, when it comes to speaking the truth to each other. Next one, prohibition. We see, don't sin in your anger, but have a righteous anger towards sin. I'm going to read those verses in 26 and 27. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. The prohibition. This prohibition is hard to understand, but I believe it says exactly what it means. Be ye angry. I do think it means just that. There's times we should be angry at sin, or angry at um, people mistreating other people, or... or or taking or mis or sinning against God. No, I don't believe we should be going around as angry people, or I don't think um, we should um, constantly be angry about the world around us. The Bible talks a lot about joy and gratitude. Still, I believe the anger God gives us when people do wrong things against us um, and against other people is okay. Not only is it okay, it's the proper response to evil and sin against God and others. Yes, God and his son, Jesus Christ, showed us times when they showed their emotion of anger. It was never done in sin. It was always done properly. It was always a proper response to sin. I believe Paul is telling us the same here. We should be angry towards sin, and yes, we should never sin in our anger. Again, we need the Holy Spirit to show us how to do that. Um, there's a lot about anger that there's often times when anger brings sin. I've see, seen it in my life. We see it in people around us. Um, Paul is very clear that we should not be sinning when we get angry. I think we all have the emotion of anger. It comes to us different ways for different people. But Paul is very clear. In our anger, we cannot sin. 
Um, and I think we need to, let, again, let the Holy Spirit um, work in our lives in this. There's a correct way for us to deal with anger or to, for us to deal with um, people uh, being mistreated or seeing God being mistreated. Um, we should pray that God will show us how to do this this week through his word and through the Holy Spirit. The next one is do not steal, but work with your hands so you have to give to them, to those in need. There's another prohibition that looks pretty easy for most of us. I don't see too many people around this church as thieves and robbers. Um, I wouldn't expect to add out of too many of us here, and I think most of us can probably pick our shoulders up and say, that's not me, and this prohibition is not for me. If you dig in a little deeper, I think we're going to find this prohibition to be for me also and for all of us here. Um, and when you look at the positive part of this um, verse, let me just read this verse. It may bring to light a little more, if we take this personally, um, to what it means to steal. And remember, these verses were to Christians, Okay. And I think I often in the past thought, well, the Ephesian Christians were pretty carnal Christians. They were liars, stealers, angry people. I don't think that's, they were much different than us here at Weavertown. I think we probably have some of the same problems that they had. So when we look at the verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. If we just stop there, it's easy for us to just let go and say, that's not me. But it says, but rather let him labor working with his hands. If we just stop there, we, as good Mennonites, can handle this one too. Um, we work very hard to do the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now, we've stopped in the last part of those phrases. It might bring some conviction into our lives, and I'll get into that in a bit. How many of us... Um, maybe I'll, I'm going to step back. But if we examine the problem of stealing more closely... We may, be, we may be even, and maybe even look at the attitude here, we might find ourselves as those who have broken this law. What I mean by that is how many of us work so we can have to give to others? Most of us say, yeah, sure, that's why I work, do we? On the other hand, how many of us are willing to be taken advantage of, or, I'm sorry, how many of us are willing to take advantage of others? Their time? their resources, or anything else that takes away from someone else. I'm convinced that when Paul talks about stealing, he's not talking about a thief who goes into Walmart and takes something and doesn't pay for it. I think he's talking about something we find probably in our own church, in our own lives. I believe he's talking about someone who would, instead of not working too hard, be willing to let everyone else do the work. Now we're getting home a little bit. How about... Church house cleaning. By the way, that's on the schedule. How about doing things that we really don't want to do? Somebody else can do it. Is that taking advantage? When there's something to be done, are we quick to sit back and let others do the work that we are called to do? Paul is saying that laziness or someone unwilling to work with his hands is stealing from others. I'm convinced God's looking for Christians to be the most willing. Don't you think so? What, our, what has our willingness been to give to others this week? I, I'm convicted. I'm guessing most of us probably are if we take this verse at face value. There's never an excuse for laziness. We all have different abilities and strength and even energy levels. I can't outwork my sons anymore but I have no excuse to quit working with my hands to give to those who are in need. We often think of these givings as financial, and they are, but it's much more than that. The vital aspect of this commandment is that we are using our resources to help those in need. And if you think there's not many people in need, I don't think we've looked around, or I don't think we've heard what all needs to be done here at Weavertown next this week. I also believe we should ask, again, let the Holy Spirit show us the needs around us. Let him help us overcome our laziness. 
The Christian walk is never a lazy walk or a selfish walk, but it's a hardworking, selfless walk where we're willing to help those in need. By the way, what walk did Jesus walk? Did he ask us to do the same? Let's go to the next one. Don't let evil words come out of your mouth. Speak words of encouraging and encouragement to each to others. Let no corrupt communication, like it says there, or like the NIV says, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. What comes to your mind quickly? Again, being in the construction industry, there's quite a few foul mouth men and even women at times um, in the construction industry. And I think, well, that's not me. I wouldn't talk that way. I also think about dirty, disrespectful sexual talk and crude jokes. And I'm not sure this is exactly what he's talking about. I will say, I hope we as Christians aren't part of that. But I think if we dig in a little deeper, we're going to find this prohibition a little more convicting to us probably also. I believe he's saying that if the things we say are not edifying or building each other up, then they are wrong and prohibited as Christians. Again, that might make it a little harder for us. So I want to ask us how we did this week. Were the things we said building others up, or did we say things to make us look good and make others look bad? Did the words we used this week bring life to others? Or did they do things to make others look bad and me, me good? Again, I believe Paul brought these prohibitions to show us our continual need for a Savior. If we're at the fourth prohibition and we still don't see a need for a Savior or a need for repentance or a need for um, Christ, then we probably haven't let the Holy Spirit work in our life too closely. I know we've all mess, missed the mark, and all of us need to continue to confess our sins. Yes, Jesus will continue to forgive us and make us righteous because of his righteousness, but we need to confess our sins. And if I look at these um, four prohibitions so far, I'm convinced that I have a lot of work to do yet. The Lord is still trying to lead me in his walk, in his way. On a positive note, this verse says... God is looking for Christians to use words that build up those who, who need encouragement. How does it say? That no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying. We know what that is. Just Christians encouraging each other. That's, and we have some, I've been a benefactor of this um, in many ways by you here and um, by people in my life, li life, People willing to encourage me. People willing to edify me. People willing to build me up. God is looking for us to do that for each other. Many of you have also been people who, because of the Holy Spirit, have given words that have built up and encouraged others. The tongue harnessed by the Holy Spirit is mighty and does so much to build others up. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to use our words to build others up. Only through the Holy Spirit are we going to be edifying others and building each other up. And if we pray every morning that the Lord would use my tongue to build each other up, amazing things would happen. I forget to pray that prayer too often. And because I forget to pray that prayer, I often miss the mark when it comes to encouragement um, and building other people up. The last one. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by becoming bitter. Forgive those who have wronged you. And I'm going to just read those last three verses. Let no, um, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye calm one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And I might be reading into this a little too much, but it, I believe... The way we often grieve the Holy Spirit is by allowing, a bitterness, um, allowing bitterness to come into our life. This last prohibition is so essential. 
I'm not sure what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit, but I do believe any time we disobey any of these prohibitions, we grieve the Holy Spirit. But the following verse, I think, is a direct reference, especially to the bitterness. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? Think about the word grieve. When I think of what it means to be grieved by someone, I sometimes think about how parents feel when their child walks away from Christ. You've met parents like that. They are grieved. And I believe the Holy Spirit is grieved the same way when we walk away from him. I don't know how to put a picture to that word grieved other than thinking about a parent who loses a child um, or has a wayward child. And just like parents grieve a wavering child, the Holy Spirit is highly grieved and hurt when we become bitter and unforgiving of others. In verse 31, bitterness and its results are seen extremely grievous to the Holy Spirit and to our Father. Bitterness is a lack of forgiveness. When we think about how God forgave us and how much it costs His Son, Jesus Christ, for us to be forgiven, and when we aren't willing to forgive others but choose to be bitter towards them for what they did to us, that may be one of the most grievous acts of disobedience we can commit to our Heavenly Father. Brothers and sisters, if we're in bitterness, we need to let go. We need to forgive. We are grieving the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced one of the most grievous ways to hurt the Holy Spirit is to live in bitterness. When you think about what Christ did for us, we have no excuse not to forgive others. Bitterness is not only grievous, but it leads, in verse 31, to rage, to anger, to brawling, or church fighting and splitting, to slander, and every form of malice, Malice, which means the intention to do evil towards someone. All these things take place when we choose not to forgive others. But the alternate to forgiveness is a tender heart, kindness. I think of this, my sister years ago when her husband mistreated her pretty drastically and she was asked um, she was asked why do you forgive him and she said this she said I have two choices one is to forgive and the other is to become bitter and she said being bitter is what much the alternative is much worse than the choice to forgive and I believe that one of the hardest things in the world to do one of the hardest things in the world to do is to live in bitterness. And one of the most important things we could ever do <clears throat> and the results and choices of forgiving is such a drastic difference than the results and choices of being bitter. It's the choice Jesus made when he chose the cross so we could be forgiven. It wasn't Jesus' easiest choice, but it was... For our sake, now we can make that same choice for others. I also want to note another thing here. We often forget about, another thing we often forget about forgiveness, and that comes to the last verse. We often have thrown this verse off for our little children, and that is, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That verse is not an easy verse just for children. It is for each one of us. It's, it is for children to be, it is to be taught to children, but it's probably even more important that we take a look at this verse ourselves. To forgive, we need to do it with kindness and with a tender heart. I believe I can say kind, tender hearted people are the only ones that can forgive others. Look at the word tender hearted. What is the opposite of tender hearted? It is hard-hearted. Hard-hearted people don't forgive. Tender-hearted people do. So choose who you want to be this day. A kind-hearted, forgiving person or a mean, hard-hearted, unforgiving person. This choice will have massive implications and will affect our eternal destiny. 
God's rules or prohibitions are not grievous, but all for our benefit. I hope we see that this morning. They are there for us to benefit from. They aren't easy, like most rules aren't. But when, they, but when we follow them and walk as new men, the benefits will always be better than the alternatives. I also believe the only way to walk in God's way, ways is to cry out daily and to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in His ways. And I'd like to do that right now um, as we pray. I'm going to ask Him and all of us, <clears throat> for all of us, to give us grace to obey His prohibitions and walk as Christians should walk so we can enjoy the benefits of a tender-hearted, forgiving attitude. You can. Let's kneel together and pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with a big need of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We ask for your Spirit to guide us daily, this week as we go about our week. Um, I think your Scripture clearly gives us instructions on um, what to do and what not to do, and we want to ask your Spirit to show us, those, um, to show us how to do that daily um, as we go about our day. Help us to have tender hearts forgiving hearts, hearts that are willing to um, be molded by you and to be, um, be led by you. Help us to walk the way of the new man and not the way of the Gentile. Thank you, God, for your instructions and scriptures. Thank you for people who went before us who gave us um, your word and continue to um, speak your word into our lives. Thank you so much for your faithfulness um, in walking with us and for the Holy Spirit that guides us um, in your ways. Thank you again for your love and faithfulness and what you did for us on the cross um, for giving us the opportunity and ability to forgive others also. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand and sing 919. Nine hundred nineteen. Let's sing verses one, three, and four. I am resolved. I am resolved. do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And I'm going to read those verses for us in closing. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen. Part in peace.